Welcome back to The Pursuit Zone. I'm Paul Schmid, the host of this podcast that interviews explorers that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 210 with Eric and Maudi from Wheels to Wonder. In this episode, we talk about some of their travel experiences before cycling, their favorite and least favorite cycling destinations so far, and how they make their YouTube videos and improve their storytelling skills. Let's start the show and let me introduce my guests. In 2018, they began a long cycling adventure heading east from their home country, the Netherlands. Some of the places they have cycled include Turkey, Iran, Oman, and Japan. They've experienced the extremes of the high mountain passes through Central Asia and the heat and humidity of Southeast Asia. Along the way, they've captured these moments with their cameras and created some of the best cycling videos on YouTube. Their channel is called Wheels to Wander, and you can find them at their website, wheelstowander.com. Eric and Maudi, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. How did you two meet each other? Our relationship this April is going to be 10 years, but we already knew each other like three or four years prior, I, I guess. Mm, that's a little bit too much, I think. Maybe one or two, yeah. Yeah, one or two. I'm yeah, not sure, but but somewhere on a, a mutual friends. Yeah, it was kind of a, a party kind of scene. A lot of people getting together, making music, good conversations, dancing. And on one of these parties, you were there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure exactly where we first met. Um, I guess it was we saw each other in some places here and there and it was not like love at first sight, but I was always yeah, somewhat interested in in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, uh, finally, we went on uh, to go climbing together with some other friends. I was planning to go to India with a friend. And yeah, I actually just asked uh, out of nowhere, like, uh, yeah, won't you come uh, with me? And then you said, yeah, well, I will think about it. <laughs> Yeah, and I was thinking, India, that sounds, wow. I was uh, for, for quite some time really interested in going to India. And then she asked me, and that was the perfect opportunity to go with a, with a beautiful lady to the country I wanted to see. So, great opportunity. Yeah, so we were with another friend. And um, yeah, in the beginning, that was, uh, yeah, how, how can I call that? <laughs> a little bit awkward, maybe. We had to meet each other. and. We had to look if we could get along with each other. And then we went to India and actually we had such a great time that we went a second time with three of us. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we really so, hit it off with the other guy as well. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of the beginning of our. Yeah. And then the second time we were boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long did you travel in India? First five time weeks? was five weeks. Yeah. yeah. We went from uh, New Delhi uh, up to uh, uh, Dharamsala, and from there to the to Rajasthan, Jai Salmer into the desert, and then uh, eventually uh, a little bit down, and then back up to the Himalayas. And uh, the second time we actually um, we planned to go only to India, but there we uh, we met this couple. They called themselves the Rolling Oldies, and I will tell about them a little bit later. But they kind of convinced us to rebook our tickets from Calcutta to Amsterdam. Yeah, to fly from Kathmandu. They, they told us, because we were in Darjeeling, and uh, that was really close to the border with Nepal. And so they really convinced us, so I mean, you have to go, you have to go, you have to walk the Annapurna circuit, and that's, that's something you don't, you don't want to miss. So, so we, we, we skipped that flight. And uh, yeah, we booked a flight for a month later uh, back. So we did Nepal as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Which was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. How long after these experiences in India and Nepal did you start the cycling tour? I think it was probably seven or eight years. I think seven years later. Okay. What was your life like? before you did the cycling tour like were were you in jobs and did you have to quit those jobs 
Yeah, so uh, I did just several part-time jobs. I was never really the kind of person who wanted to pursue like a career or something like that because I always wanted to, I knew I wanted to travel the world in some way or another. From my perspective, I'm, I did a, uh, my degree in, uh, in construction engineering and I worked at an architectural firm, but I got kind of fed up sitting behind the computer all day long. That's not too bad in itself, but uh, as a draftsman, I was drawing these buildings uh, day in, day out. And after a while, they all looked the same. So, yeah, it was, was somewhat boring. So I finally quit my job at the architectural firm. And, and from that moment on, I was kind of drifting a little bit, wanting to do something new. So I did uh, some studies in an art school and I really like to work with my hands. So I also did some alternative uh, building projects, uh, one in Portugal, building an earth ship. And yeah, f- from there on, actually my, my solo travels also started. I went to Morocco in 2009. That was before I met Maudi. In these in between times, uh, I was working also several jobs. We were living anti-squad, so that's a for a for very affordable rent. So we, we could have uh, more free time than people having a regular job. Yeah, and from there, yeah, we were always interested in, in doing adventures, in, in, in hiking and going to, to Spain, to the Pyrenees, or to uh, Norway and Sweden. We've been to Scotland. Yeah. Eric, I read on your website... The trip to Portugal, I think, is where you you met Peter Gastelo, who has the website The Big Africa Cycle. I'm just yeah, curious. It's fabulous. About, yeah, I'm curious about how, like, were you at that point thinking about going on a cycle tour, or how did that experience of of talking to him influence you? Yeah, I, I was not thinking about a cycle tour at all. I, I never realized that that was possible until I met him. Do you know anything about building an earth ship? Uh, earth ships are with the packed, the tires packed with dirt. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we were busy with these tires and, uh, and Peter was cycling uh, by with his, uh, with his friend at the time. I don't know if he found the project or not, uh, but he started helping for uh, like, uh, like maybe one or two hours. He also wanted to pound the tire and, uh, I was immediately kind of drawn to his energy, super lively, but also uh, also relaxed and polite. And I was thinking, where, where is this guy going with, with all these bags on his bike? So then he cycled off thinking I would never meet him again. And then when the, when the building period closed, um, we went back uh, with, with, with several uh, other people to this town. It's on the sea between... Morocco and and Portugal but there I met him again and he was still with his friend so I could talk to him a little bit more directly uh, and I was just like on on, on a bike with with bags and he was cycling from London to South Africa and I was like pretty stunned actually that 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 was possible at all (laughs) so I started following the his website and I was I was captivated by the photos he made and also by the stories he told, yeah, some pretty extreme things. And one of these things stood out for me when he was in Senegal. One night he was walking on the street with his cameras and these, uh, these big uh, guys come up to him demanding his, uh, his camera. He said no. The first thing they did, they hit him with a machete in his hand. So they cut the tendons in his, from his fingers and they sliced them in his, in his leg. And then he had to recuperate there for a month. The tendons had to be sewn together again. And then he was, was still was going on. And I was thinking, wow, man, what a special human being. What, what a special person you have to be to go on and not to, not to give up. Yeah, not yeah. to give up and go back. I think a lot, a lot of people, most people probably would have gone home. Eventually, you guys make this decision that you're going to go on this cycling adventure. How long did it take you to plan for it and to get yourselves ready for it? Uh, we took about one and a half years to prepare for this journey. 
we could have left earlier, but uh, because we already had some savings, but we extended our departure until it was the right season. Yeah, and then um, we sold all our belongings and we only had a few boxes, which we left at our parents' place. And Yeah, we went. We went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a crazy moment. Yeah. We didn't own a car. We didn't have a, like a, a house. We lived on the squad, as Eric said. So it was that was quite easy. Yeah, and we, we don't have uh, pets or children or commitments to our job or to other people. So in that regard, it was quite easy for us to go. It certainly helps the less stuff you have. Guys, just one second. I don't understand this term anti-squat. Can you explain it? <laughs> yeah. When you have a building and it's vacant, in the Netherlands, there is a law, and that law has been changing the last couple of years. But when, when we lived that way, it was possible for people just to go in, to break in, like illegally. And then you could put in a bed, uh, a chair, some clothing, and then you could call the, the, the police. And then you could say, yeah, I squatted this building. Yeah. And, and it was kind of a kind of a legal way to obtain a vacant building. And the way we lived was the other way around. It was to prevent people from squatting these buildings. Oh, so in a sense, you're like a caretaker? Kind of, yes. So, yeah. yeah, but we but we had to pay for that. We had to pay kind of a, it's not, a it's user not like fee. A, yeah, it's not it like just, a regular... Uh, um, it's not like a regular rent, but it's more like a user fee. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you guys did was you got your bikes secondhand and then you refurbished them. I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about your bikes and how you found that process of refurbishing your bikes. My story is maybe a little bit longer than yours, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, personally actually never really considered buying a new bike, so I buy many things secondhand. I actually remember those people in Nepal that we met, they were also cycling the world, and they uh, told about their adventures and they both own the Koga Miata World Traveler. So that was always stuck in my mind. Like, okay, if I ever wanted to do this, uh, this must be my bike too. Really? I didn't knew that. Yeah? Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like the only option for me, actually. It was like, okay, that's going to be my bike. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, those guys have it. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to have one too. <laughs> yeah, it's maybe Great. a strange uh, way of doing it, but. Yeah, I've searched on the internet and uh, finally this bike came along. I went to the person who owned the bike. He was actually a someone who just fixed old Koga bikes. And uh, yeah, this bike has never seen uh, uh, outside of the Netherlands, so it was still pretty new. And uh, yeah, I took it home and it didn't really fit my body size, I would say. So I had to find a lot of parts that actually really fit my, my height. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how I uh, put together the bike. Yeah. yeah, I was on a kind of a redemption kind of a mission. Uh, I once had this, this giant uh, aluminium mountain bike. And in the time I worked the night shift with one of my good friends, he was the kind of the technical machine builder, machine worker, really, really handy guy. I had some problems with, with my bike. So I took it to the night shift and there we started to deassemble this bike. And then he said, yeah, yeah, we can take, take this part off and then, we, and then we can paint it. And so we, we disassembled the whole bike and then we broke some, some special rubbers kind of, kind of in, a, in a hydraulic fork. The O-rings. Yeah, kind of the O-rings, I guess. Yeah, but, but, but it was O-rings and the O-rings, they were connected with, with some spring, some circular spring. It was kind of, kind of a special, specialist kind of part and it was unable to obtain uh, those parts and also the tool to get it back in because we we just yanked it out and that project got really out of hand we disassembled the bike we put it in some boxes and then <laughs> we shoved it under some uh or it went in the closet somewhere and uh, for years it was standing there so that way i lost kind of my my mountain bike and i was always like fed up that i didn't fix the bike so for this project I really wanted to have a redemption. Yeah, 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 kind of a redemption project. Just it came in really handy because you could fix both our bikes. When <laughs> yeah, it was like a, it was like. A, I'm not really of the the technicals. I always try to put that on Eric. Like, can you please help me? 
Yeah, I was like, like we were going to places in Tajikistan or in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, maybe places where we were would be far off civilization. Uh, at the one hand, I wanted the redemption for my old bike. But at the other hand, I really wanted to have the skills to fix the bike and Maori's bike if we would have problems in some uh, far, far away place. So I, I found this old mountain bike in a, in a kind of a garage sale for 40 euros. And I stripped the whole bike and I put it together with, with a lot of second hand and, and also new parts. I had it painted and it was almost a new bike when we left. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. You guys are using a traditional luggage setup, uh, two bags in the front and the, the two pannier bags in the back, and maybe a bag on the rear rack between the, the back panniers. Are you satisfied with that setup, or do you think when you start again, you will change? I'm actually pretty satisfied with the setup. I chose the orderly panniers, and I have the, I think it's the plus variety, right? Yeah, you have the one with the, the Cordura, yeah, so uh, with, with the inside is uh, is coated. It's a kind of a softer fabric, so I was kind of afraid that they weren't as durable as the classic version, but they held up pretty great. Better than my bag, so I have the classic. That's the, the more tougher vinyl material, but I'm a little bit clumsy, so <laughs> <laughs> I fell over a couple of times. And actually, her bags look better than mine. Yeah, so they do have some holes in them, but it's not like a big problem. They are mostly in the, the lower part of the, the bag, so when it rains, that doesn't really matter. Yeah, I think for a new setup, yeah, we would both like to go a little bit more lightweight, and we will we want to look for a setup that we could go more off-road. We really like uh, the off-road nature parts of the journey. and um, For sure, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's a little bit difficult because we carry so many camera equipment, so we have to look for ways to to make our setup a little bit lighter. Yeah, so we we had a look at the at the bikepacking style uh, bikes, and they look absolutely great. I'm really interested in the in the 29 uh, plus uh, wheel size, then with some lightweight frame bags. Uh, it looks absolutely great. Only for what we carry with the camera equipment, also a drone. The panniers, they feel really safe. It's just like a bucket. You roll it up yeah. and, and it's watertight. And they are also really convenient. Like the bikepacking bags, we never use them, but they seem a little bit like unhandy to... They're clumsy. Put, yeah, put yeah. all your stuff in and out. And like a lot of small bags compared to the orderly panniers are just yeah one bag and you organize it in the bag and that's really handy for us right now. But yeah, we have to try yeah, if the opportunity arises to try a different style, yeah, we, we will try. And then maybe we'll make like a, like, like a blend, see what works best for us, and then uh, we'll adapt. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the places that you've traveled to. I'd like to hear what are your favorite places, what are your least favorite places. Maybe we can start with talking about just naming a few places that you enjoy traveling to and why. Yeah, we we absolutely have some uh, some favorites that we think both agree on, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the first one has to be Turkey. That was one of the first uh, countries that really like surprised us in its hospitality of the people, also its beauty, and just overall, it was such a yeah complete experience. I would say the food is is really tasty. The people are really warm. A uh, beautiful place uh, to cycle. We had really good weather, and we 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 started in kind of the late summer and then into the winter. So we had we had all the seasons as well to see in Turkey. That was beautiful. Yeah, and it was I guess one of the first countries where we experienced uh, like this hospitality that I talked about in that extent. Like we were. Uh, probably invited for maybe five times a day to come and have a chai or yeah, have some something to eat with the people we met. So yeah, that was pretty pretty cool. Tajikistan for me was was incredible. Cycling uh, between those uh, big mountains and on the on the high plain, like long long stretches without any people there, and like a feeling of solitude in in, in the middle of these giants. 
Yeah, it was it's, it was spectacular. It was it was everything I hoped for and even more. Yeah, like sure. like like you make an idea, like like, like maybe a, a dream vision of it, and and even when you're there, you're just like every corner around every corner. It's just wow, <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, we it's... took took so many pictures there. It's, it's that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's such a it's an interesting challenge in in both ways, like physically, but also mentally. And it's such a great way to experience like a completely different culture, seeing yurts and um, yeah, the the way life is up there is just kind of like you're living on the moon. It's such a different world. Yeah, people are really friendly, maybe a little bit introvert, but but really friendly and helpful. Yeah, not at all what we heard from those countries or, or even what we thought about Central Asia. Um, here in the Netherlands, there's like a consensus of uh, it's, a, it's, it's a backward place. Maybe there are terrorists there and well, yeah, couldn't be farther from the to truth. To be honest, that, that, that's true. Yeah, yes. but that's, that's such, a, such a hyper small percentage. Of course it is. So, yeah. so that's, that's, a totally, that's only the news that, that arrives to Europe from that place probably also in other places like america as well yeah we but, have just, but, but uh, when you're there it's just like the people couldn't be more hospitable than yeah, yeah it's than, like like iran we in the west we just have like this skewed image of what it really is also places like iran people are so warm so welcoming for us it was sometimes too much even <laughs> because we're not used to it to it at all it was just feeling like a celebrity <laughs> People stopping you for 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 selfies and you you get invited and and yeah we we, we honestly had the feeling like we could uh, n- not that we would do that but that we could enter the country without money without food and we it would just strange. be taken care of that we honestly had that feeling that we could do that yeah it was amazing yeah. it yeah. was amazing the hospitality in Iran was by far the yes, the biggest exactly. of any country in in our travels. Yeah, exactly. From what I've heard of Iran, you could go there without money and probably make it all the way through. And you guys are fortunate you have the Netherlands passport, so you can you can get in and have those experiences. Yeah, that's a big advantage. Yeah, that's very sure. fortunate. I think from the United States and also people from from Great Britain, they have they have troubles to get in. I believe. Did you have a um, so Turkey? And Tajikistan and Iran. Did you have one other that you wanted to mention for some of your favorite places? Yeah, two actually. Two actually. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we really, uh, we really were surprised by Georgia. It was, yeah, we we didn't have really like expectations besides like beautiful mountains, like the the Caucasus Mountains. Maybe we were a little biased because we came from this. This place, like we were cycling in the Middle East and Turkey for a very extended uh, yeah. time already. Eight months when we uh, entered Turkey until we entered Georgia. So we were with uh, in, in in the kind of mid Middle Eastern part of our journey. It took like uh, eight months, and then we flew from Oman. We flew to to Georgia. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of a. Uh, Kind yeah, of a culture shock. Kind of a culture shock, but like a really welcome one at that moment. It was also in Georgia. The hospitality was was really really present. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, very every, hospitable people. In another way, yeah. like we <laughs> we were used to like uh, no alcohol and um, a lot of chai in Turkey, and then we went to Georgia, and there was like this abundance of alcohol everywhere. Yeah, it was crazy. There was one one day we were cycling, and it was a pretty fierce cold wind and it was a car stopping and I was a man coming out of the car and he said stop stop uh, I have something for you uh, here are these these police jackets he had these big big warm police jackets but we had our, our winter jackets with us so so we didn't need them and then he told us yeah I'm the, I'm the local chief of police and I want to look out for you so if here's I, my number yeah here's my number if there's is there if there's any problem you, you can call and here are two bottles of wine and one bottle of cha-cha. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of our introduction into Georgia. And from there it went yeah. on and on. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Police giving you alcohol. I like that the, the culture and uh, like this this uh, kind of ex-Soviet vibe in the country is, is pretty interesting. And they have this, really this soul, uh, a lot of dancing and singing and 
they're just wonderful people and a beautiful country to to cycle through. Yeah, and one of the interesting things uh, was is that they they do a uh, a lot with things that are we in the West would consider a rubbish, maybe like a car door uh, they they would use for a fence, and and all of these kind of really smart solutions for <laughs> for simple problems. And then they had the cows and the pigs and the geese. They were walking in the streets. Yeah, farm animals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, farm everywhere. animals. They, there were almost no fences. Everything was roaming free. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, amazing country. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And Japan. Yeah, Japan. Yeah. Yeah, Japan is just a world of its own, actually. It was also, uh, again, after like a transition in our trip, we flew from Kyrgyzstan to Japan. We applied for the Chinese visa two times uh, and we got rejected two times. So we were in Japan and uh, that was actually also a very nice change. We were both pretty excited to cycle there. It's just a very convenient country to cycle in. Uh, Everywhere shops, uh, it's very safe. Uh, The people are very polite and helpful. Yeah, beautiful country. And it's absolutely gorgeous, uh, yeah, nature-wise. Yeah. yeah, you have to look for it a bit. There, there's a lot of nature, but there's also a lot of infrastructure, yeah. a lot of cities. And and that's interesting, too, actually, to dive deeper yeah. into the culture there. It's it's really like to say the longer you are there, the, the less you actually sort of understand of how it all works. It's it's so interesting. You can You can be there for a year and learn so much. Uh, yeah, interesting new things. Yeah, and the safety was on such a level. In in the Netherlands, I wouldn't leave my full loaded touring bike at a at a shopping mall. We never. But did but, that but, but in Japan, you, only in Japan. In Japan, you could do that. Yeah. Which we just left our our bikes with our bags. Maybe only take uh, our passports, and then we went shopping together. And we also camped in uh, urban areas. That was also the first time in our trip. Yeah. That we felt felt safe doing that. Yeah, yeah. So so incredible for any uh, beginning cycle tourist. Uh, Japan is highly recommended. Yeah, but also for the the more um, of course for the for the more adventure advanced as well. seekers. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me use this Japan discussion as a, an opportunity to ask you about your budget. I'm curious <laughs> as to uh, because Japan can be known to be expensive. It is. When you set out on this adventure, what was your sort of planned or average daily budget? The budget, we looked it up at different blog sites, people talking about their budget, and we kind of made a consensus between budgets, some people doing it for $10 a day and other people doing it for $50, $75 a day, and we were looking at how much do we earn, uh, how much can we save, and well, how do we want to travel. We wanted to wild camp a lot, but also kind of realized that, that a hotel now and then would also be be great, especially later on when we get to the editing of the videos. We tried in doing that in the tent, and uh, that's not ideal uh, at all because you have to have some uh, some power also to provide for the laptops. Yeah, we looked at uh, how much would we eat in a day, how much would we drink, and how many times in a week or, say, a month uh, would we go to a hotel. We knew we would go to Southeast Asia, and there we most definitely would take more uh, hotels and hostels because it was cheaper there. Uh, But in Europe, for example, uh, hotels are also very expensive for us. So we we knew in the beginning of the trip, we do a lot of wild camping and then slowly we would get a little bit more into a convenient place to... uh... Yeah, in in Japan, actually, we we camped almost the whole three months, uh, except for our time in Tokyo and um, our time at like this family of of a friend that we met on the road. And in Southeast Asia, we actually didn't camp at all, maybe three or four times because it was just very... Um, affordable for us and it's also just very nice and <laughs> relaxed to just sleep in a bed to be honest yeah yeah it's it's also pretty crowded in southeast asia so i also felt more comfortable sleeping inside yeah and we kind of calculated that as well 
we made kind of a, a daily average of about 25 euros and uh, we would spend kind of uh, 20 euros from that and five euros was for kind of a saving for visas uh, maybe some repairs or or a flight and in the end this for us the 25 euros for two people per day was i think uh really good yeah let's go back to talking about some of the places you visited and and let's talk about the flip side of um the challenging places of the places that you've been which ones did you find to be the most challenging first oman i've had a, like a quite a bad experience in oman unfortunately um so that was a pretty challenging time for me so that's why it was also such a great um, moment to fly to georgia and that's why Georgia was so well. Uh, <laughs> um, welcome say? change. Welcome, yeah. And also Vietnam wasn't really our favorite, especially the north. We had some, yeah, I, I experienced some harassment as well. And it was just in general, the people were quite, yeah, how, how can you say that? Yeah, nice they were there. <laughs> In, in my idea, the people in the north of Vietnam are are, are proud, and there's a there, there's a somewhat of a macho culture, especially between the men. But you also can notice that between the women. For instance, uh, that we we were cycling past the group, and then one of these guys, they we would just say something in Vietnamese to us, and then he started laughing, and then the whole group started laughing, in a, in a kind of a Mean Not way. in a very, very <laughs> positive way. But that, that and that was more happens. than once. Yeah, that happened all the time. So it was kind of using us to be cool in front of the group kind of thing. And it was actually the only country we, we ever experienced that. Yeah, but it, it actually changed quite a bit when we entered the, the South. Yeah, the South was different. Yeah, people were, were way more welcoming and, and, and relaxed and polite. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Oman and, and Vietnam, any other places present challenges? Mm, not really, huh? Yeah, of course, some places has, have uh, physical challenges. I think one of the most challenging things besides the countries is uh, like if, if we have tensions between us. I think for me, that was the most difficult in the trip. Yeah, yeah well, they, because you if you have you have tensions be- between each other. You you just you're not at home, and you don't feel at home anymore with each other. And then it's it's kind of a lonely place to be. Yeah, yeah. We knew when we set off that the the peaks would be higher than what we ever seen before, and that was totally true. But also the the valleys, kind of the, the lows, would be deeper. Yeah, sometimes it's a it's a real struggle. <laughs> what do you guys do to to try to prevent that, do you ever spend time apart? Not really. Mm, yeah, no. maybe on the bikes that for an hour or maybe two hours we're cycling a hundred meters. It, yeah, but it <laughs> also wasn't like we had like. Of course, we had some uh, uh, fights or, or how you uh, how you want to call it. Yeah. But it was not like that extreme that we actually were thinking about separating <laughs> or not really um, no. or breaking up or anything, but. I think we both personally grew as well as person just to kind of get over it more quicker and just to accept somebody in its like. Yeah, maybe maybe somebody says something and he is tired, he or she is tired. In one sense, you tend to be more forgiving because you know that from your own uh, experience, but it's also you are the one that's tired and is hungry. And so. You you also throw it out sometimes, maybe a little bit too easy. It's kind of a balancing act sometimes, but for sure, as 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 an individual, I grew a lot, and also I think as couple we grew immensely. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, this was like a, we we had to do this. Yeah, we had to. Yeah, we had to. It's, it's, it's for everybody. Yeah, it's a great test of your relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly. Traveling as a couple provides many advantages. I mean, it helps with the filmmaking. Yes. 
you have somebody to talk to so you don't feel alone all the time. Having traveled as a couple and experienced all these, the positive side of it, would you ever want to travel and do this type of bicycle travel solo? Yeah, before we went, it's a long story, but I actually considered cycling alone. I think, also did the, the hike alone in, uh, in Scotland. Yeah, I did a hike alone as well. And I really enjoy that. But having traveled now together for such a long time, I think it's just a lot of fun. And it's really great to have company and uh, being able to share and enjoy the things together. I want to try it alone. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if I really want to. <laughs> I guess for shorter trips, I would be okay. And maybe not for two years. Definitely not for two years. No, but but sure. maybe for two months, that would be, it would be, would a, be real, a great challenge. It would be a real interesting challenge. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I would do it, if I would really feel like uh, safe on my own. But Then yeah. you go to Japan. Then I will go to Japan for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Guys, I got to say, I love your videos. They are just, when I found your channel this sum or la t summer of 2020 i just thought oh my gosh these videos are so good i eventually have to get you on my podcast to talk about this and in your creative process i just wow. love i love the oh, videos oh, thank you <laughs> thanks thanks <laughs> that's great to hear thanks when when you were starting your adventure and and, and putting your bicycles together and getting your equipment, were you at this point beginning to think about, oh, we should start a YouTube channel? Yeah, actually. Yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Actually, I we thought about this question, but. Yeah, in the, in, in, in the process, um, this year and a half before we uh, started uh, cycling, we, we talked about it. We wanted to make photos. We saw a lot of other people doing uh, websites. So we talked, do we want to go? And have a website, maybe write a blog, and then we would start talking. But what if we would film it all? Like, wouldn't that be like like the, the greatest kind of a diary yeah. for us in our old day? You know, maybe maybe twenty, thirty years from now to look at our young selves cycling around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like kind of this romantic idea, sharing it with with our grandkids or something. You know. Yeah, and also we really enjoyed the idea of uh, sharing our journey visually with our friends and family instead of just yeah telling them on the phone what's happened. Yeah, we really like that uh, that idea and oh, yeah, and, and and we both are really enjoying uh, um, photography. I did have a filming school uh, in the past, so yeah. I was already into filming. Yeah, that's kind of how it grew. Just uh, why why don't we put it out there and inspire other people as well? Yeah, so in the beginning, I learned a lot from Maudi. Uh, she was had, had a, kind of a specific uh, editing style, and for me, is that she is really good with the with with the soundtrack, so the song selection, and and then editing to the music. I learned a lot from that, so I kind of assimilated that and looked at what I found interesting. Yeah, but I came into it as a, a complete novice. Yeah, but we both learned like a lot from each other because along the way we just um, yeah learned from tutorials, but also like talking about different editing styles and different shots and and uh, yeah storytelling and yeah just trial and error and we became more creative along the way actually yeah yeah and a lot of inspiration from other other people doing YouTube videos as well oh yeah yeah of course perhaps you know cycling about Ellie Denham yes. I do. Yeah, for for us, he was like a, something to look up to. Also, uh, e. e. Oan from Bike Wonder, Bike Wonderer. Bike Wonderer, yeah. Yeah, he's doing a more more long format kind of a style, but his positivity and and he is always in this adventure, a kind of happy go lucky mood, and it was like uh, infectious in a way. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ma many, many more people. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to. There's so many things to talk about. I'm, I'm just going to start getting into it here. When I before to prepare for this interview, I went back and I, I watched some of your videos again, and the second time, I really noticed the audio. The audio really stood out to me, and it seems like you're 
you're layering sound in there. So you have one track that's music, but there's, I think, another track that's just like sound effects, like birds chirping (laughs) and the tires of your bike crunching on the gravel. And I thought, is that, are they doing that on purpose or is that, are, are you thinking about that when you make the videos to, to do that intentionally? And it's all in camera. When somebody drives past, it's just what the camera picks up. We shoot with the Sony A6000 camera and we have a Hachu microphone. And for that, we also have this, uh, this dead cat, this, this wind uh, blocker. Yeah, this kind of a wind blocker. So we already knew from the onset. Actually, that was a tip from another great bicycle personality, uh, Tom from Tom's Bike Trip. Uh, I read a blog post that he was telling that that audio is, is the one thing that people can really can get put off on. Uh, like if the, if the audio is harsh or there's a lot of uh, volume changes uh, or, or, or it's really busy, uh, people tend to dislike that more than the video um, quality. Than, than, the, than the video images. So that kind of really stuck. And from there, we all tr- always try to splice the audio together, not per se layer the audio with, with sound effects. Sometimes we do that, but we try to keep it as authentic as we can. Well, sometimes we have some problem with the audio from the camera. There are some loud pops or ticks or yeah, we do, a lot we of wind noise or something. With, uh, we do replace that, for example, with some other footage that is similar that we shot before. And we replace the audio so so it doesn't uh, really, uh, it isn't really bothering to listen to. Yeah. No, it's re- yeah, I really like that, your, the style, your editing style. How do you divide up the work? Kind of what is your process? You mean on the road or like the editing Yeah, so itself? I'm assuming that each of you has a Sony A6000 camera with a microphone. So is that true? That's correct, yeah. And so at some point during the week, you're going to stop and have to make a video. How do you divide the labor? And I'm wondering, like, or, like Maudi, are you the editor? And um, like, kind of what's your process of downloading i download the footage from the camera step one and then step two i do this so i'm just curious so we 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 started editing in italy and from there i think we we edited uh one video every two weeks and then we kind of do turns so mari does one edit then i do one edit and then kind of that's the way it goes now that you've told me that i'm going to try to look and see if i can tell the style apart from each of you on how you edit. I didn't notice a difference in in styles and editing. They're very close between you two. Yeah, we do try to to have like this consistency in in colors and uh but there's a difference. I think I can see. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, yeah we yeah. can see, but it's interesting because uh my father, he's also uh a passionate uh video editing uh person. And he can, for him, it's impossible to see our our different styles. So I'm really interested if you you can see the difference (laughs) and and who is who. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I wanted to ask you about your cameras because, you know, you're using these Sony A6000s. And by the way, obviously, it's a great choice because your videos have turned out amazing. But when I think about it it seems like maybe not the best choice because i don't think these cameras are weather sealed and i would question how do they hold up on a cycling tour how how has been your experience working with these cameras it's interesting Uh, both cameras are second hand so we bought the camera second hand also the lenses are also second hand Uh, only one i I have one sigma 16 millimeters 1.4 so it's very shallow depth of field we sometimes use, but mostly we use the 18 to the 105 lens. That's a stabilized uh, f4 lens. Yeah, it's it's not weather sealed. So, uh, for example, uh, we did one episode in Austria in in kind of a thunderstorm, and Maudi kept on filming, and then our, our kind of lens and then the whole system just fogged up, 
And in the morning, there was she had this. The, her lens was just completely foggy from from the inside, and we were thinking like, "Wow, this is the end of the lens." Yeah, that's actually what we really wanted to improve for the future to be able to film more in bad weather conditions because it's. I think it could be really interesting for people to kind of see us struggle to <laughs> through this bad weather. And now we actually often skip those parts because it's just very bad for our equipment. But you have an action cam, I think, the Sony action cam. What percentage of your videos contains the action cam camera footage? It's very low. Yeah, it's very low. And, and we put this like, um, it's a sealed, it's like a case around it, right? Yeah, that's a waterproof casing and for, that, for diving. And that's why the audio isn't being recorded when we film. Yeah, it, it is being recorded, but it's muffled by the case. Yeah, it's really bad. So that's that's why we don't often film with this. Yeah, it's 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 more for speciality shots for tires or or the or the frame or or maybe underwater or for for just these these special kind of shots you you wouldn't want to risk your uh, regular camera with. The image is 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 not that great. Stabilization is really nice, so that's a big plus. But the images you get from it. Mm, it's it's yeah we're getting a picky now a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're definitely looking for a, for like a more advanced setup i would love to have a camera that could uh, shoot more like ultra slow-mo and 4k and we also are kind of bothered by the when you look at other videos on youtube you can sometimes see this like crispiness in the shots and we really miss that with our own videos um, so we think like uh, yeah, a better camera could or better yeah, lens. It's also the lens. Yeah, the this lens. Uh, this um, 18 to 105 lens. It's an ideal lens because it's an internal zoom lens and it's stabilized, but it's not a very special lens. It's good, but for example, we love to make portraits of people and for portraits, it's just really soft. Even when you have a person almost uh, filling the frame, uh, then it's it's still not sharp, so that's that it's for us because we're kind of a hybrid shooters. We love to take pictures as well as well as video. You know, we're, we're looking at our images and we think, "Wow, that was a really special moment." And now it's the photo is not sharp. Yeah. So yeah, and it also has to do with the learning curve. We saw a lot of videos, a lot of tutorials, and then then you get kind of kind of infected by other people and other people's standards. <laughs> Yeah, then, then your mind starts wandering to yeah to to better equipment. That is nice, but it's not a must. Yeah, but it's not a must. Right, it's not the equipment. It's the it's your skills as a, as storytellers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, that's and, why people probably yeah. watch the videos. <laughs> and actually, that's the that's what we talk most about: to how how to tell the story differently. We watch other people on YouTube or in documentaries. And then we discuss what works and, and what doesn't work. And, uh, oh, there is so much to learn. Yeah. So have you gotten more confident over time with filming people and putting yourself into a situation where you're coming close to a person with a camera? How has that ev evolution been for you? It's super interesting, really. It's um, in the beginning, you're feeling very awkward, even filming yourself, like doing these vlog style videos. Um, when there's people around, for for example, uh, you get more comfortable with this, but also approaching people. Yeah, we sort of try always try to make eye contact or ask people if they're okay with filming, and if they're not, yeah, we just we just stop. But actually, most of the people kind of like it and don't really mind. So yeah, I, I think eighty percent of the people don't mind. But it, it it is pretty pretty interesting because, for example, when you uh, approach a person or a certain situation you sometimes get really close to a person and and then this person is looking into your camera and it's a pretty intense moment i think i really enjoy that moment yeah me too especially those portraits that we, we make it's really um yeah just the, it's a really powerful moment with yeah. the person and also when you see it back yeah then yeah yeah you have really have this short special connection with somebody that you maybe won't have otherwise when you when you will not film that situation. Yeah, that's interesting that 
because the camera can also be a barrier. When you're holding the camera, you're looking through the lens, you're also in a way putting a filter between you and the experience. Yeah. But in it also challenges you to go into situations you wouldn't otherwise go into to talk to the the man at the stall and maybe you can film his fruits from behind the stall mm -hmm. or you have somebody paying him and then you you're filming his hand from really close yeah and that, that's that's really you're, interesting you're kind because of getting into the details yeah you're getting uh, into the details as well yeah so yeah it, it goes both ways you're kind of uh, sort of sucked out of the moment as well yeah but also a look look into things in another way yeah, you get you get more closer as well, yeah. and 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 then also because you you feel like wow, this is a great story to tell. There is somebody baking a traditional bread in a tandoor oven. Okay, you of course you can look at it, but if you go film it from all kind of different angles, yeah, yeah then you see it also from all kind of different angles yourself, and and, and you try to to get your camera into the oven, <laughs> and 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 uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly adds adds to the experience, I would say. Yeah. I can't do it without it. <laughs> the next trip. <laughs> it's addictive, yeah. Yeah. What are you doing with the portraits? Do you put them on your website? It's no, it's like a film portraits. So it's like um we we hold uh, the camera for about ten to twenty seconds and uh we ask people to just look into the camera. Yeah, and we we we're not super confident with that. So you won't see that a lot. But we really like that, so we want to really learn to put people on on ease and 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 to ask if that would be okay. But also for the photo portraits, actually, we we don't really share that anywhere yet. The photo portraits, no. We have that on our computers, and perhaps we will do something with that in the future. And but for now, we have an Instagram page, and. It seems like people are are mostly interested in in cycling pictures on our Instagram page. So if we if we post something uh, with a picture, and and we do, uh, but not that often on Instagram, just just to mix up the the feed a little bit. But yeah, that people don't seem to find that really interesting. Uh, like like a really interesting for us, an interesting portrait of a gentleman in Tajikistan, for for example. Do you ever go back and watch your old videos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do, especially when we uh, feel like traveling again. <laughs> um, yeah, and to kind of relive the experience. So. Uh, and you do it a little bit more often than I do. Yeah, I just, I just really like it to just get back into that moment where I felt so happy. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I also watch a lot of other people's adventures too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I not that often, but sometimes. For you guys, um, what is your favorite part? Or you spent like two years on the road cycle touring before the pandemic, you know, slowed you down. During that time, when you look back, what's been your, you know, your favorite part? What do you enjoy most about cycle touring? I enjoy a lot of things. One of the things that really stands out is obviously meeting other people from other cultures and really experience their uh, way of living and also the feeling of yeah really being free that's pretty strong feeling like having your whole home your whole setup on the bikes and and you're just uh, yeah able to go anywhere you like it's also interesting to to learn more about the world to learn more about yourself and pushing like your boundaries physically and mentally and uh, yeah, it's it's great to feel physically strong and also make videos about uh, our experience and share this and inspire other people. Yeah, it's uh, what Maori says. For me, it's that kind of changes. In in one moment, you're sitting on the bike, maybe you're listening to some music, and and you're you're just floating in space in in this beautiful new place you're you're at. What's always driving me is what is behind the horizon. You have this, you have this saddle this cura yeah. curiosity. And, and you're climbing and, and, and you're, you're sweaty and, and you're, you're beaten down and then you get to the saddle and then you look over to the, to the kind of the new valley and it's like, wow. And the downhill. Yeah. And the, and the downhill, of course, the downhill is always great. The food, uh, the people and your own thoughts on the bike, 
just when we look at each other and 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 just exchange exchange a smile you know you you, you both know what you're smiling about it's just an uh it's not a feeling you 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 get so easily and that often in in, in kind of regular life for us yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of the 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 velocity of all these changing moments with kind of a like a deeper impact yeah it's, it's, it's much greater on a, on a trip like that where will your interests take you next we don't know actually yeah we don't know yeah. because we would love to go on a new adventure we're also thinking about the future our future settling down somewhere perhaps in uh in in an maybe a, a maybe nearby or, or, or distant future and or maybe like like a base because we don't have a house or a place we can go back to so we're all, always dependent on our family and our friends so we would like out like to carve out a little place on the planet for ourselves just to call home like a base camp to to go and explore yeah, so we uh, see ourselves maybe living in kind of more like a, a homestead situation. And um, that goes hand in hand with like having the possibility to to have like a job that uh, doesn't depend on a certain location. So we, we kind of try to build that up for ourselves. And uh, for now, we really feel like continuing our YouTube channel. It's just one of our most fulfilling hobbies that we've ever had and all the the comments and, and emails that we get. Um, yeah, that's that's really wonderful. So we're really looking into a new adventure now, but yeah, obviously there's not a lot of perspective <laughs> for us. We're in a complete lockdown right now. And yeah, the messages for this, for the future aren't, aren't so positive either at the moment. So if we could uh, for a longer trip, yeah, we would really like to discover the Americas or perhaps even uh, Africa. And if not, we will be staying closer to home for now, probably, and then go up to Scandinavia, maybe have a little side uh, trip to Iceland, uh, and then going down to the Baltic states, to the Mediterranean. Uh, that's kind of the general plan for, for our new trip, if that's uh, going to be possible. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what Maudi said, it's a really fulfilling hobby that we have. Slowly, uh, it's turning into a kind of space that the, the YouTube that we have some really serious earning from it. Um, and that would shift it into uh, a real job opportunity for us. And yeah, that would be something we really never thought we could do. <laughs> but now there are some opportunities in, in, in that space and uh, that would be great. There's so much to learn. There's so much to give. And just like you said, it's actually, it's the most fulfilling job I have ever had too. Just the positivity that that people give you on the feedback on your on your videos it's just it's sometimes overwhelming yeah i'm I'm really uh, happy also, also and fortunate to be a part of that also so. the occasional hate comments of course yeah <laughs> but but that these these are few and far in between and actually, I also see that as a kind of a a positive thing that people if 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 they are out there and they want to be negative, I think that's part of the of, of this journey as well. So it's, 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 it's a learning curve. How can people contact you or find you online if they want to learn more? They can go to uh, our website at uh, wheels2wonder.com and they can send us an email at wheels2wonder at gmail.com. That's the best way to, to contact us, yeah. Yeah. Eric and Maudi, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, selfishly, of course, I hope you guys continue on these adventures and making these videos because they're so great. And I uh, just want to thank you again and uh, stay safe out there and best of luck. Thanks, Thanks so you, much, Paul. Paul. It was Thanks really for this. great to be on your podcast. Yeah. Thanks again for listening. This episode was recorded on February 8th, 2021. If you want to write to me, my email address is paul at the pursuitzone.com. You can also leave me a voice message by either recording a message with your phone and emailing it to me or by using SpeakPipe. You can do so by going to speakpipe.com slash the pursuit zone. The best way, as always, to support this podcast is to be sure to subscribe and let other people know about it. Share it with your friends, share it with your family. You can find the Pursuit Zone podcast anywhere where you get your podcast audio. 
To find out more information about this episode and others, head on over to thepursuitzone.com. Thank you.